A very good evening aspirants, a warm welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy. Today I am going to discuss 7 different topics from the Hindu newspaper dated 7th December 2022 and displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today, you can go through it. Now without much delay, let us get into the article discussion. Take a look at this news article. See the winter session of the parliament is going to start from today. 25 bills are listed for the 17 day winter session of parliament. And this includes two financial bills. But the opposition parties have expressed their concern about the limited time available for any meaningful debate on the bills. And yesterday there was an all party meeting in which the opposition parties said there would be even less time available to raise other relevant issues. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this backdrop, let us learn about the sessions of the parliament and some terms related to sessions of the parliament. Now first, let us start with sessions. See, it is the president who summons each house of parliament to meet from time to time. See, parliament meet at least twice a year because the maximum gap between two sessions cannot be more than six months. And this is as per the article 85 of the Indian constitution. See, there are usually three sessions of parliament in a year. One is budget session which is held in the period from February to May. Then there is monsoon session which is usually held in the period from July to September. See this year this monsoon session delayed because of the pandemic. And finally there is winter session which is held in the months of November and December. So when we say a session of parliament it refers to the period spanning between the first sitting of the house in a session and its prorogation. And when we say recess. It refers to the period spanning between the prorogation of the house and its reassembly in a new session. This is all about session. Now let's see some terms that are associated with session of parliament. These are adjournment, adjournment sine die, prorogation, dissolution and quorum. Now firstly let's take adjournment. See a session of parliament has many meetings and each meeting in a day consists of two sittings. Know that a sitting of a parliament can be terminated by adjournment. Here the term adjournment is defined as termination of the sitting of the house. After the termination of the sitting, the house meets again at the time appointed for the next sitting. And this is about adjournment. Now let's see about adjournment sine die. See it refers to termination of a sitting of the house without any definite date being fixed for the next sitting. Know that the power of both adjournment and adjournment sine die lies with the presiding officer of the house. And this is about adjournment sine die. Now coming to prorogation. See prorogation refers to termination of the session of the house by an order made by the president. Know that prorogation is not done by the presiding officer but by the president of India. This is about prorogation. Now let's see about dissolution. As we all know only Lok Sabha is subjected to dissolution. Since Raj Sabha is a permanent house, it is not subjected to dissolution. While the prorogation terminates a session of Lok Sabha, dissolution terminates the life of the existing Lok Sabha. So what happens after the dissolution? See after dissolution, general elections are held and new Lok Sabha is constituted. And this is about dissolution. Now finally let's see about quorum. See quorum refers to the minimum number of members required to be present in the house so that the house can transact any business. And know that article 100 deals with the quorum of the house. And as per article 100, the quorum to constitute a meeting of either house of parliament shall be one tenth of the total member of the house. If there is no quorum at any time during a meeting, it shall be the duty of the chairman or speaker either to adjourn the house or to suspend the meeting until there is a quorum. And this is about quorum. See these are all some of the information and terms pertaining to the session of parliament. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about three sessions of a parliament then some terms associated with sessions of a parliament. See this topic is very important for your prelims exam kindly make note of it. With these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now let's take up this text and context article for our next discussion. It says that the telecom regulatory authority of India that is the TROI is seeking comments about the introduction of a calling name presentation feature. See the comments are sought by floating a consultation paper and the time given for giving comments is until December 27, 2022. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about the points mentioned in the article. 
and we will also see about the calling name presentation feature now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it first of all let us know about the calling name presentation feature see the calling name presentation which is shortly known as cnap is a supplementary service which enables the called party to receive the calling name information of the calling party it may sound a little confusing i will explain it with an example say there are two persons named a and b and a is calling b for some reason as we already saw cnap enables the called party to receive the name of calling party here a is the calling party and b is the called party so b will receive the name of a in his mobile phone here you may get a doubt like we are already receiving the name of calling party on our mobiles right so what is the necessity of this feature here you have to understand one thing see the names that are appearing in our mobile phones are the numbers that are saved in our contact list if a particular number is not stored in your contact list then we won't get the name right see the calling name representation feature is similar to true caller and bharat caller id that is we will get to know the name of calling party and this is about the calling name presentation feature see the basic idea behind cnap is to ensure that telephone subscribers are able to make an informed choice about incoming calls this feature can also curb the harassment by unknown or spam callers now all of sudden why this feature is introduced by try there are two reasons for that we will see them one by one first of all we all know there have been rising concerns about robo calls here robo calls are made automatically using it enabled systems with a pre recorded voice and we also receive spam calls and fraudulent calls see according to true callers 2021 global spam and scam report the average number of spam calls per user each month in india stood at 16.8 and the report also said that the total spam volumes received by its users is more than 3.8 billion calls in the month of october alone see at present smartphone users are rely on inbuilt features or third party apps like true caller to mark and tackle spam calls this we already saw right however as per troy the users reliance on crowd sourced data is not be reliable so this is the first reason why troy decided to introduce calling name presentation feature now coming to the second reason see existing technologies present the number of the calling entity on the receiver's handset see this is also a supplementary service and it is called as calling line identification presentation when your telephone customer receives an incoming call the telephone number of the calling party is displayed on the called party's telephone and this is done through calling line identification presentation feature here the problem is that the receiving party is not given the name and identity of the caller so they sometimes choose not to answer the calls believing that it could be unsolicited commercial communication from unregistered telemarketers and this could lead to even genuine calls being unanswered and this is the second reason for the introduction of calling name presentation feature now coming to the text and context article as per the article cnap mechanism may violate the caller's right to remain anonymous it is an essential component of right to privacy here you may think why should someone remain anonymous and call a person see an individual may choose to remain anonymous for multiple reasons for example whistle blowers or employees who are being harassed etc so a framework for the feature should be developed which is in parallel with the digital personal data protection bill 2022 and finally is this cnap feature enough to address all the problems no see most of the unwanted calls are from telemarketers they make calls for commercial purposes know that previously telemarketers were registered as promotional numbers so this made it easier to identify and block them but now the marketers have started deploying people who are not a part of the entity's setup they are at home workers and the work is being outsourced to them here the problem is that these workers are given sim cards which are not registered to a particular company and it will be registered to the individual themselves so here the constraint is identifying all of them and blocking them we all know that this is a difficult task and these are the two concerns that are mentioned in the news article the first one is privacy problem and the second one is difficulty in identifying all of the spam callers now what can be done see the government must invest in digital literacy the government should also invest in skilling citizens to navigate and use the technology better and it should be ensured that the users do not share their data indiscriminately 
and finally the users should be informed about dangers such as financial frauds and spoofing and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about a new telecom feature that is the calling name presentation feature and we saw the reasons why such feature is introduced and we also saw about the problems associated with the feature and finally about some possible solutions see this topic is very important for your mains exam kindly make note of each and every points with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article this news article says that the northeast monsoon's first probable cyclonic storm is likely to trigger heavy rain here the meteorological center have warned heavy rain particularly over northern tamil nadu this is about the crux of the news article so in this backdrop let us understand about northeast monsoon and the factors responsible for northeast monsoon now before getting into discussion let's have this basic understanding see the term monsoon has been derived from the arabic word mausin meaning season the monsoons are nothing but the seasonal winds which reverse their direction with the change of season to be very specific it is a double system of seasonal winds that is they flow from sea to land during the summer which is called as southwest monsoon winds and they also flow from land to sea during winter which is called as northeast monsoon so this is a brief about monsoon so what are all the factors responsible for northeast monsoon formation the first factor is the migration of intertropical convergence zone to the south of india then the second factor is change in wind pattern see during mid october the southwest monsoon withdraws completely and that is when the wind pattern rapidly changes from the southwesterly direction to the northeasterly direction so this is the second factor responsible for northeast monsoon formation and the third factor is global climate parameters like el nino la nina indian ocean dipole etc see they also have an influence over intensity of northeast monsoon and that's all about factors responsible for northeast monsoon now we will see about the mechanism of northeast monsoon see during october to november with the apparent movement of the sun towards the south the low pressure trough over the northern plains becomes weaker and this is gradually replaced by a high pressure system so the southwest monsoon winds become weak and start withdrawing gradually and by the beginning of october the monsoon withdraws from the northern plains and the low pressure conditions over northwestern india get transferred to the bay of bengal by early november see this shift is associated with the occurrence of cyclonic depressions which originate over the andaman sea and these cyclones generally cross eastern coasts of india cause heavy and widespread rain so this is how monsoon retreat and gives rainfall to the coast of tamil nadu andhra pradesh and north interior karnataka remember one fact here the bulk of the rainfall of the coromandel coast is derived from depressions and cyclones and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about what is monsoon then the factors responsible for northeast monsoon formation and finally about the mechanism of northeast monsoon now with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this editorial article this article talks about the air pollution in delhi see we know that air pollution is not just stopping with causing irritation and eyes or burning our throats it also causes some deadly health problems like stroke heart diseases respiratory diseases and cancer and when we look at the statistics india currently reports 2.5 million air pollution related deaths annually see this statistics provides the seriousness of air pollution in and around delhi that's why a lot of measures are being taken to address the air pollution in delhi but still delhi's air quality has not seen any improvement why this is what the question of the author and he provides the reasons for that having seen the essence of the news article now let's discuss the reasons cited by the author for prolonging air pollution in delhi also we will see the measures suggested by the author to address the issues but before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here kindly go through it first of all let's see the reasons for delhi's air pollution firstly as you all know the reason that everyone cites is stubble burning but in our today's discussion we are going to see reasons other than stubble burning because stubble burning is not the only reason for delhi's air pollution see if we take the burning of biomass in and around delhi it would be the same as stubble burning in other states so here in the article the author does not say the stubble burning is not a problem 
but there are other reasons as well so now let's discuss what are all the other reasons for delhi's air pollution firstly delhi chokes on its own dust and industrial activities see the rules relating to handling of construction and demolition waste is not strictly followed not only this there are several unauthorized industries who are a large emitter so the lack of emission control technologies is seen as the major source of pollution that is from the industries now look at this graph this graph pictures the pollution levels in delhi for the past 5 years see it is peaking beyond the ambient air quality standards right so the problem has to be addressed immediately or else the unauthorized emitters will keep on polluting the air this is the first reason now the second reason is there is less use of public transport see the less use is due to the lack of last mile connectivity then the problem of crowding in buses and metros the other reasons also include the inability of the public transport to reach and navigate through narrow lanes not only this the poor maintenance of the public buses could also be the reason see this discourages the people to use public transport and it encourages to use their own vehicle for commuting it also constitutes for the increased air pollution in delhi this is the second reason now coming to the third reason it is the inefficiency of commission for air quality management see the commission for air quality management is a statutory body established by the government of india in 2021 See it is constituted for better coordination research identification and resolution of problems related to air quality but what the commission is doing it is issuing the same orders as issued by the environment ministry and the pollution control board see this inefficiency also called as the major reason because the commission is not providing innovative solutions to curb the pollution in delhi this is the third reason then the fourth reason is the same things are done year after year to address the air pollution problem and there is no permanent solution to curb the air pollution in delhi for example schools are closed every year then people are advised to stay indoors not only this even construction works is also stopped and the industries which are emitting more are also asked to shut although these measures are taken does it address the pollution issue in long term no right this kind of stopping people from doing their regular work is not a good governance so the lack of long term measure to curb the pollution is the fourth reason then the fifth reason is flaws in the governance system see for example a single entity like pollution control board is tasked with the responsibility of air quality management the board performs tasks like operating of silos to purify the air then issuing orders relating to pollution control and the implementation of orders etc see putting burden on single entity is not seen as an effective measure to control the pollution and this accelerates the problem caused by the pollution this is the fifth reason and final reason is that the government is taking measures only during deepavali and when stubble is being burnt see the poor air quality is a problem on most of the days in delhi but there is no permanent measure to maintain good air quality in delhi see these are all the major reasons for air pollution in delhi other than stubble burning now with this let's see the impacts created by air pollution in delhi firstly it affects the environment because the air quality is being at a very poor or at a very risky level this means not only the environment is getting damaged but the species that depend on environment is also affected know that not only humans but even animals are also at heavy risk of getting affected with deadly diseases like tumors for example we can say this particulate matter in the air has been linked to cardiac arrest in dogs this is the first impact then secondly it affects the economy to a large extent see though the measures like work from home seems fruitful for a temporary period of time they affect economy to a larger extent and the people's work may not be as efficient as they work from office because there may be lack of coordination among the team members not only this the marginalized people are greatly affected by the pollution in delhi because they are the one who is living in more congested areas and they are prone to inhaling the polluted air to a greater extent see the government is doing measures like closing the schools on peak air pollution days and what is the impact it affects the education of the children right so these are all some of the impacts caused by air pollution so from this what can we understand yes the impacts of this air pollution is multifold thus the author concludes by saying that a more comprehensive and long term measures is required throughout the year that's all regarding this news article discussion see in this news article we saw about the reasons for air pollution in delhi other than the stubble burning 
and we also saw about the impact of air pollution on environment economy and the people and we concluded that the impacts are multifold this topic is coming in news frequently so you may get a mains question regarding delhi's air pollution kindly make note of each and every points that we discussed in the article now with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article this news article says that the international labor workers group has criticized the central government's labor policies see the policies were criticized at the 17th asia and the pacific regional meeting of the international labor organization and according to the article the workers are demanding a new social contract which includes decent jobs for all then respect of rights for all then fair wages including minimum wage and the respect for equality and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn about the four new labor codes of india before starting our discussion let's briefly see about the term labor code see the labor code is a codification of labor laws in a legislative form it is a tripartite mechanism which governs the relationship between employer and the employee while allowing the government to oversee the relationship this is all about the term labor code now coming to the four newly introduced labor codes of india now let's first see the reason why the four new labor codes got introduced in india see many provisions of the previously redundant labor laws trace their origin to the time of british raj however with changing times many of them either became ineffective or did not have any contemporary relevance see these laws rather than protecting the interest of workers some provision acted as hindrance for workers therefore the present government has repealed the non useful labor laws now with the introduction of new labor laws 44 central labor laws with over 1200 sections have been assimilated into just four codes and the names of the new four codes are firstly minimum wages code secondly industrial relations code thirdly social security code and finally occupational safety health and working conditions code this is about the four codes now let's see about the four codes briefly now first let's start with minimum wages code see in minimum wages code four previous labor laws have been amalgamated into single minimum wages code according to the government this code will help around 40 crore workers of unorganized sector in the country to get the right of minimum wage this is about the wages code now coming to industrial relations code see the code on industrial relations governs working conditions trade unions layoffs and dispute resolution in this code all possible steps have been taken for industrial units and workers so that disputes do not arise in the future here note that this code has certain provisions which allows the government in public interest to exempt any new industrial establishment from the provisions of this code this is all about industrial relations code now moving on to social security code see to ensure security for all workers the central government has amalgamated nine labor laws into social security code this code will secure the right of workers for insurance pension gratuity maternity benefit etc through this code a comprehensive legal framework for social security has to be created so that the workers can receive social security completely and this is about the social security code now finally occupational safety health and working conditions code see this code will specify provisions like leave and maximum work hours it will also look over the health and safety norms including adequate lighting and ventilation and welfare measures for the workers and this is all about the four newly introduced labor codes now let's see about the advantages of the four labor codes firstly these codes will help in easing the compliance procedure for both the employers and the employee here note that these codes have been based on the principle of single registration single license single statement and minimum forms this is the first advantage secondly these codes have been built on inherent flexibility which allows the state governments to modify the codes further as per their unique situation and requirements and finally the safety and social security concerns of the workers are taken into consideration and timely disbursement of wages and social security benefits are given importance in this codes see these are all the advantages of newly introduced codes see these codes have some disadvantages as well we will see them one by one the first disadvantage is the massive power given to the employers to hire and fire the workers see the code permits companies with up to 300 or less workers to fire their employees without any prior government approval see this is in contrary with the current criterion of 100 or less workers 
See, this leads to insecurity about the tenure of workers and putting them in a constant state of fear and dilemma. Furthermore, these courts snatch away the right to strike off workers by prohibiting strikes without prior notice. This severely hampers the ability of the workers to carry out spontaneous strikes in response to harsh working conditions and other unjust practices in the company. This is the second disadvantage. Thirdly, the Occupational Safety, Health and Working Conditions Code fails to take into consideration any establishments with less than 10 employees. While this has certain benefits, as it incentivizes employers to hire less than 10 workers to avoid complying with any labor code regulations. See, these are all some of the disadvantages associated with four labor codes. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about four new labor codes and the advantages and disadvantages associated with the four codes. Now, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. The news is that the World Bank has increased its growth prediction for India's economy this year. See, the growth prediction has increased from 6.5% to 6.9% in October. The World Bank has done this because of the India's resilience in economic activity despite deteriorating external environment. So, in this news article discussion, let us understand why the World Bank thinks that there is resilience in economic activity. Before getting into discussion, kindly note that all these findings were stated in the latest India Development Report titled Navigating the Storm. Now, let's see the reasons for increased growth prediction. The first reason for such a prediction is that there is a strong upturn of country's GDP in the July to September quarter of 2020-23. Here, despite pressure due to inflation and more restrictive lending standards, the real GDP grew by 6.3%. And the particular reason for such a growth is strong private consumption and investment. This is the first reason. Then the second reason for increased growth is that there is a rise in domestic demand in the first half of 2022-23. See, the rise in domestic demand is due to government's focus on strengthening the capital expenditure. Here, capital expenditure is nothing but the money spent to create assets or to reduce liabilities. Remember, the capital expenditure can be either the long-term investments by the government on creating assets like roads and hospitals or the money given by the government in the form of loans to states or repayment of its borrowings. And this is the second reason for increased growth prediction. Then the third reason is Indian economy's capability to remarkably resilient to the deteriorating external environment. Here, by the word deteriorating external environment, the report is talking about the Russia-Ukraine war. See, this war elevated crude oil and other commodity prices. And there were persistent global supply disruptions. See, this was caused by the global shortage of shipping containers, then supply bottlenecks and tighter financing conditions, especially with limited forex reserves in India. Even though these shortages created domestic inflationary pressures, the real GDP of the country have grown by 6.3% in quarter 2 of financial year 2022-23. And even in such a situation, India has strong macroeconomic fundamentals like inflation, GDP, national income and unemployment levels. See, this have placed India in good stead compared to other emerging market economies. In addition to this, if you have a doubt whether India is experiencing jobless growth, the answer to that is no. Jobs are actually created in India, but they are all in the informal sector. So, the problem here is the absence of a policy that makes job creation visible. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the reasons for the increased growth prediction for India's economy by the World Bank. See, this topic is very important for your mains exam. You may get a mains question regarding India's economic growth. So, you may quote these points in your answer. Now, with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. This news article talks about a direction given by the Karnataka High Court to the State Information Commission. See, the High Court asked the State Information Commission to decide whether Bangalore International Airport Limited is a public authority under the Right to Information Act 2005. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about State Information Commission in detail. See, the State Information Commission is a quasi-judicial body. Know that it is created under the Right to Information Act 2005. See, this was constituted in addition to the Central Information Commission. And know that all the states have constituted the State Information Commissions 
through official gazette notifications this is a brief about state information commission now let's see about important functions performed by state information commission see state information commission is a high powered independent body now the first function is they act as second appellate authority for rt applications note that here the first authority to receive rt applications is the public offices here we may say government offices like collector office tahsildar office etc so they are first authorities now state information commission is acting as second appellate authority for rt applications this is the first function secondly they are entrusted with the power to enquire into complaints made under rt act and thirdly they have the powers of a civil court know that no public record can be withheld from it during inquiry of complaints fourthly they have to submit annual reports to the state government and these reports are tabled before the state legislative assembly these are all the important functions performed by state information commission now we will see about the composition of the state information commission see the commission consists of state chief information commissioner and not more than 10 state information commissioners know that they are appointed by the governor on recommendations of a committee see this committee consists of chief minister as the chairperson then the leader of opposition in the legislative assembly and a state cabinet minister who is nominated by the chief minister this is about the composition now talking about the qualification see the chief information commissioner and information commissioners should be persons of eminence in public life and they should have wide knowledge and experience in law science and technology social service management journalism mass media or administration and governance and there is also one condition that they should not be a member of parliament or member of legislature of any state or union territory also they should not hold any other office of profit or they should not be connected with any political party or carrying on any businesses this is about the qualification now what about the term of office of state information commissioners see they hold office till the age of 65 or 5 years whichever comes early and know that the information commissioner is eligible for the post of state information commissioner but he can be in office for a maximum of 5 years including his tenure of information commissioner and this is all about the term of office of state information commissioners and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about state information commission its functions then about the composition and finally about the qualifications of state information commissioners with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at this first question see this is a previous year question which was asked in 2020 upsc civil services examination prelims now we will get into the question consider the following statements let's take up the first statement the president of india can summon a session of the parliament at such place as he or she thinks fit see this statement is actually correct see article 85 clause 1 of the constitution states that the president shall from time to time summon each house of parliament to meet at such place and time as he thinks fit so statement one is correct now coming to the second statement the constitution of india provides for three sessions of the parliament in a year but it is not mandatory to conduct all three sessions see as we discussed the session of lok sabha is called for at least two times a year and the constitution does not state that three sessions of the parliament should be called in a year so statement 2 is incorrect now coming to the third statement there is no minimum number of days that the parliament is required to meet in a year see this statement is correct because there is no provision which states the minimum number of days that the parliament is required to meet in a year so statement 3 is correct now the question is asking for correct statements so the correct answer for the question is option c 1 and 3 only moving on let's take up the second question consider the following statements related to the distribution of rainfall in india now let's take up the first statement western side of the western ghats and sub himalayan areas in the northeast and the hills of meghalaya receive the highest rainfall see this statement is correct see the highest rainfall occurs along the west coast on the western ghats here which is more than 250 cm as well as in the sub himalayan area in the northeast and the hills of himalaya now that in hills of himalaya the rainfall is over 400 cm so statement one is correct now coming to the second statement western rajasthan and adjoining parts of gujarat receives rainfall more than 100 cm see this statement is incorrect because the western rajasthan and adjoining parts of gujarat receives rainfall less than 60 cm and not more than 100 cm so statement 2 is incorrect now the question is asking for correct statement here statement 1 is alone correct 
So the correct answer for the question is option A one only. Now moving on, let's take up the third question. See, this is also a previous year question. It was asked in 2022 UPSC prelims. Now I will read out the question. With reference to the expenditure made by an organization or a company, which of the following statements is are correct? Now let's take up the first statement. Acquiring new technology is capital expenditure. See, this statement is correct. We saw about capital expenditure in our discussion itself, right? We saw that capital expenditure is a long-term investment by government in creating assets or to reduce liabilities. Here, acquiring new technology is considered as capital expenditure, as it will generate profit in the future time and helps in creation of new assets. So, statement one is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, debt financing is considered as capital expenditure, while equity financing is considered round expenditure. Both the debt financing and equity financing comes under capital expenditure. Okay, so statement two is incorrect. Now the question is asking for correct statement. Here statement one is alone correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A one only. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. And displayed here are the three main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers, and post it in the comment section. With this, we come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis. Please like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.